Here we go. Dum, 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 dum. I'm going to share screen. And then we're going to go down here. And what button do I press to go? Dum, I'm doing it here. That one. That one yeah. And we need to go right back to the top. Okay, Hi. here we go. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is our very first live class. Yep. So give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you very much for joining us. Um, do you want, Jean? Do you want to tell yeah. us a little, a little about bit about Retail Rookie? Yeah. So Retail Rookie is an idea probably formed about five years ago, and it's all about helping people who are new to retail um, and really sort of sitting there going, "Gosh, this this landscape is really confusing. I'm feeling a little stuck." And Retail Rookie is about helping the Rockies, helping the ambitious people who want to grow and trying to level the playing field. So I've worked in the industry for years and there's a whole lot of things you just know mm -hmm. and you learn. Yeah. And for Laura and I, a big part of the way where we connected is we wanted to give back. So that's where Retail Rookie is the rookie guide to everything yeah. to do with retail. Yeah. Uh, and we sort of thought, you know, we're better to start than with packaging. Yeah, absolutely. And you can kind of describe it. The the pe people that really would suit Retail Rookie are sort of your farmer's market to food stuffs kind yeah. of people. You've got a, a tested product um, and you're kind of looking now to where you can basically yep. even go and sell that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So who are we and why should you listen to us? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'll start with me. Yep. Um, so I'm Janine and I have a business called Pitchfork. Um, I've spent 20, 20 plus <laughs> years working in the FMCG industry and in food service and for every kind of business from Fonterra to Goodman Fielder to Mars um, across product development, sales, marketing and innovation. Um, so I've learned a lot from working at a lot of places and now I want to teach. So that's my focus. Awesome. Great. Uh, and I'm Laura and I own a small um, creative agency that specializes in FMCG, so fast moving consumable goods. Mm -hmm. And that is called Creative Jam. I've been a designer across a number of fields through uh, media, through hospitality, um, but there's always been a long running stand for the last 12 years that I've worked with products. Packaging is my absolute love and dream. Ever since I was a little kid, I was always drawn to buying something because of the way it looked in the package. Um, I've had a lot of exposure to working with large brands like uh, Fonterra and um, large some large Australian brands. And yeah, probably the most famous product I would say I've done is Dose & Co. So I've learned, also worked with a lot of startups. So I've seen and heard a lot of questions. So my goal with uh, being part of Retail Rookie is really to take a lot of that information that I've had from various clients and startups, put it into a place where it's really easy to understand yeah. so that everybody gets it right from the yeah. get-go. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So that is us. Let's go. Okay. So... I guess first things first, one of the things that we were thinking of about why great packaging is so crucial, and we've got four C's because we yes. like things that kind of rhyme we do. and we kind of see that, <laughs> is competition. And this isn't just about who your competitors are, but it is recognizing that if you're in a supermarket, there are 15 to 20,000 products on shelf, which is, for all of us who shop supermarkets regularly, that's a staggering amount um, to have to deal with and you really only have about two to three seconds to grab somebody's attention on shelf if they even pause at your section because you know what we're all like going up and down the aisles so you really have to have packaging that stands out because consumers don't have shoppers don't have five minutes to stand and read everything on the absolutely and it's like the way I kind of describe it is it is like a billboard you really if you're driving on the motorway and you've had a crappy day and you know Karen from accounts has annoyed you <laughs> And, you know, you're thinking about what, you, what you're going to eat, what you're going to do with the kids when you get home. It's the same thing in a supermarket. You really only have a couple of seconds and over an extended period of yeah. time repeatedly to actually grab attention. Yeah. Okay. Down. Down. Yeah. Oh, why is it not working? Let me see. It's going. This is when the computer says no. 
Let's just give us a second here. There you go. Cool. Put us to the mouse. Um, the second part is complexity. So this is where uh, there is so much that needs to come together when it comes to packaging. And I think for Laura, she certainly mm. sees it, not just compliance, but everything. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more than just, and we'll, we will touch on it soon um, when we talk about the design aspect of packaging, but there is a lot that is uh, needs to go in from a regulatory perspective, but also talking about, you know, what to actually to kind of speak really loudly on pack yeah. and what to whisper. Yeah. Uh, cost. So I'm the commercial person here. Um, cost is an absolute killer when it comes to starting up and particularly packaging and we'll go into this in a little more detail but mistakes in packaging can really kill your cash flow because you're having to invest so much in the packaging before you even get started and it can kill your sales overnight so if your product gets pulled off the shelf by the retailer you know that's it you can't just turn around and update or fix your packaging in a day, it's going to have a huge impact. And cost is something that for small businesses and when you're starting up, you know, you don't just have money to spray around if you're um, large businesses, you can suck it up a little bit, but certainly cost is one of the big things uh, that we wanted to talk about. Yeah, and so we've got a couple of little tips and things that are going to come through this, which yeah. are going to hopefully save you on cost and any kind of mistakes. Yep. All right, confidence. So great design. Um, and with retailers, all that kind of thing is going to give you confidence. One of the big things that, um, uh, and this is not an ad for me and whatsoever, um, but one of the biggest things that I deal with when it comes to designing packaging is ensuring that there is buy-in from the client. Mm -hmm. So actually working alongside and saying, what do you think of this? Do you like it? Does it sing to you? Because at the end of the day, it is your baby and that um, you're the one that's going to go out and sell it. Good design is not going to sell itself, but you've got to be the one that's out there, you know, confidently going and door knocking. And a, the other side from a retailer perspective is that if you've designed something with the retailer in mind, then you're going to give the retailer confidence that it's actually something that's going to sell off their shelf. So Absolutely. depending on your retail channel, if you've got the right design for them, then that will they'll know that it works for them and it'll tick the boxes. Excellent. Okay, so how do we do that then? Oh, yeah. Yes. So we wanted to put in probably a couple of examples. And the first one is one that, you know, don't think that um, it's only small brands that make, can make mistakes. Even big brands can make mistakes. So this is Lewis Road Creamery. Um, in 2018, they went out with this huge launch about this breakfast drink and it was low sugar and it was way better than everybody else in the market. Uh, they had to pull the entire range, and these are a shrink sleeve bottle, so it's not something you can stick it over because they had misleading sugar content. So um, the sugar content in the nutritional label was incorrect. So that is, imagine that, you know, yeah. your nutri that simple check on nutritional panel meant that their entire launch, their packaging was wrong. The retailer will just say, sorry, if your packaging is not correct, you have to take it off shelf immediately. And their, all their marketing just went yeah. overnight yeah. because you've just had such a yeah. massive disruption. So that's the kind of, you know, I, I think in this instance, it was pretty mm. much a fatal mistake at the get go. So they'd invested all their money um, and that simple packaging check, you know, really cost them basically yes. entry into a new category. So don't think it's just small brands, it's big brands as well. Yeah. But actually, you've got new brands. So boring oat milk. Uh, I think Laura and I both agreed that this is one that absolutely nailed it from the start. So for me, from a retailer perspective, they've nailed it because it's a really simple range, two products, it's really distinctive to have on shelf. The bottle stands out from the Tetra pack and it fits and the messaging it's really really clear clear and concise and yeah. I actually I'm a lover of boring oat milk um and as uh just a little personal detail about me I'm slightly visually impaired so when I go in store I'm scanning the shelves I know exactly which one is boring oat milk because it stands out from far away halfway down the aisle I know exactly yeah. what it is yeah so boring oat milk is also one and you'll hear us talk about less is more I think they're probably put yeah as less on it as they could. Yes. But you look at it and you go, okay, I know exactly what this is. Yeah. 
Cool. Okay. So we're just going to talk uh, just uh, a little bit of housekeeping here just to yeah. do there is some language which we're going to use throughout this. And we just want to share a little bit about what that is and the different elements of packaging, which are going to go into uh, the into retail. A lot of people will actually think that it's just that one product that people are going to buy that you yeah. need to do. But actually, there are a couple of other elements which mm -hmm. you need for retail. So we've got some examples right so, here. Because we're picture people. Yes. Um, so the first, and you'll hear, and the reason we put this in is because you'll hear us talk jargon. Yeah. So something can be a unit or a skew. So SKU is a skew. And this S is a skew. SKU stands for stock keeping, keeping unit. Yep. Then you have an inner or an SRT. I don't know if we've got an SRT. I don't have an SRT here. Um, SRT is shelf ready um, tray. Tray. Shelf yep. ready tray. And that will put your SKU or your stock keeping unit inside. So say it's got one of your products and inside that shelf ready will go, say, 10 of your products. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what happens is that box then gets taken by somebody stacking the shelves. The top gets ripped off and then it is displayed on shelf. So that's why they call it a shelf ready. Yeah. And then sometimes you'll have shelf ready trays that will go into a shipper and that could be called a shipper case or outer just because we like lots of names of the same things. Yes. And then you have a shipper case or outer. So this is an example of one from Daily Good. This is incredibly designed. Yours doesn't need to be as designed as this, but this is what a retailer buys. So the retailer needs, it's important to make sure this is designed to be compliant with what the retailer needs and not just this. So yes. your compliance goes all the way through in your checks because if there's anything wrong with this, the retailer will reject that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've got it. So we've got the stock keeping unit. That's the product that the consumer buys, the shelf ready, which holds those uh, SKUs in there. And then also you may need your outer or your shipper. And that's what, say, uh, your third-party logistics yeah. or your courier or, or whoever yeah. takes uh, yeah. to store. Right, next. Okay, so how do we go about this magical land of retail packaging? What we wanted to do is show you the flow that you should know and things that you should have getting ready for your packaging ready for retail. Yeah, so we've, um, we're have we going to go through each of these five steps. Uh, and the first one isn't the one that people usually think of, but it's actually the most critical when it comes to dealing with large retailers, which is checking your timelines. So this is getting your timing right, and that's not just for the design and print, but also for your retailer reviews. Your design, you need to be able to communicate to your designer if there's any deadlines, but um, you could spend all your time designing an amazing product and then be one day late for a retailer category review, and that's it. You'll have missed it. Yeah. They don't change their dates for anyone, uh, and it might be 12 months and in some instances, foodstuffs are moving out as long as 18 months to two years uh, of doing their big reviews. So it's really, really important you know that first. Yep. Second is um, discovering who your shopper, user and retailers are. So making sure you know where you're going to sell it. And we'll touch on all of these in more detail. Third is Laura. Uh, third is uh, packages, design, brand alignment, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and costing so this is the, the meaty part of it and where we talk about the actual design and the kind of packaging that you're going to be using <clears throat> and how to sort of maximize your costing on that then we've got the uh fitting testing Laura's most critical no. as she keeps saying to me <laughs> she's like it's the one thing this I need to one. know yeah um, sampling, yes. So we're going to talk about that. We're not talking about sampling the product. We're talking about getting samples of your packaging, which is very important. And the fifth one? Rules and regulations. This is where it's making sure everything ticks off. So where you can get away with a lot of things when you are perhaps making it by hand or in a farmer's market or just selling it direct through Shopify, there are a whole lot of compliance um, guidelines that you must have if you're dealing with large retailers and it's part of the paperwork for your application mm -hmm. uh, you know Lewis Road Creamery that breakfast drink they're a great example of one where they ticked off boxes one two three and four but at point five their final checks didn't work uh, and just a huge detrimental impact so yes. this is the flow that we want you to know because right. we liked things to run absolutely so let's jump into it Number one, what's your timeline? Yeah, so as I said, understanding what the critical dates are for launch. So this isn't 
um, necessarily just when do you want to do it, but everything from shelf life trials. So if you're going into a retailer and you're claiming a certain amount of shelf life on your pack, you have to be able to justify it. You can't just say, oh, I reckon it's about six months because I reckon that isn't going to meet the hurdles at step five. You know, when do you need to have samples for your presentations? When's your What's your printing and manufacturing lead times? There's nothing like um, discovering Chinese New Year if you're sourcing packaging out of China and realizing, oh, mm. oh, I am, um, I'm not going to be able to deal with that. And that's what we talk about when we say supply chain key events. So where are you sourcing from? Um, this can kill you when we talk about costs as well. If you suddenly have to air freight something because... Yes you're stuck, um, that's that's a biggie. And and trying to line thing everything up is so hard. Yeah. Um, and that's where I talk about working out your timelines up front. So have the conversations, you know, as best you can, because the starting plan is ideal. Um, I've said add a couple of weeks, sometimes depending on how much detail you have, you can add a month and make sure you talk to all the key people along the way. Yeah. So map out everything you might need and then start to say okay well this this will probably take two months do I you know is there a local supplier that I can get overnight or am I going to have to direct import a unique ingredient I had a problem with a previous small brand I had and we couldn't get an ingredient and we were going to have to air freight it out of the US and it was uh, pretty horrific yeah it, it, there's nothing like um throwing our timeline completely so you can never spend too much time on time put no. it that way you can never spend too much time on planning yeah okay uh, so my big thing um and you'll see tips along the way is to actually work backwards not forwards when it comes to retailers so if you're wanting to present to the likes of foodstuffs north island foodstuffs south island uh countdown they publish <laughs> all their category review dates on their website um, so in the pitchfork, um, so in my um, in my website, I've got a list and link to every retailer's site where you can go in, look for your category, and find out what the dates are, um, and then they'll give you all the dates for the submission. So go and have a look. They publish them out at least twelve months. So absolutely, that's the first place if you want to get into big grocery retailers. Go there, uh, and know that they work. Um, a review can take six months from start to finish. Yeah. So they're not doing a review in a month. Um, they were doing a review a long way out and they will generally publish further out. Yes. Cool. Okay. Understand which parts link together. And keynote here is pretty much everything links together. Um, if we're talking about the different packaging elements, uh, we spoke a little bit about ordering stuff out of mm -hmm. China. So yes, Chinese New Year is a massive one. That's about a week where literally everything will shut and close in China. Uh, and also there will be differences in sea freight and, and air freight. I've got a couple of tips on how you can manage that. Um, but yes, everything kind of links up together. So it's best what you can do is probably create a bit of a spreadsheet with timing on that uh, when you can expect to have things and then give yourself a really good leeway on working that from there. Yeah, and don't expect that just because a label manufacturer is in New Zealand, you can call them and they'll print it next week. Yes, because... <laughs> They probably can't. No. So sorting out those different elements is what I mean is you need the label, you need the shipper, you need the ingredients on the inside, all the lids, all those things have to come together at one point. Uh, do your homework on potential suppliers. So don't assume that there may only be one supplier for a bottle or a lid or a label um, because not everyone's the same. So doing your homework and getting a few cost quotes as well will be really helpful. Yeah, and, and also don't be afraid to ring these suppliers and yeah. talk to them. Even if you choose not to go with them, it's okay to ring and ask questions. Um, you might find a bottle on their website. Don't just assume that it's in stock or they have enough for you. So yeah. if you can ring and say, I'm interested in this particular bottle, can you get me a thousand units? Um then they might say yes, or they might you might be able to sort of negotiate on getting yeah. you know a smaller amount to yeah. begin with or something like that. Uh, and check if they've worked with small businesses before. So that's probably one that they understand. Um, they can actually give you a lot of help. So people who are used to dealing with big businesses just kind of mm -hmm. they they're not going to help you a lot. So you want somebody that's dealt with small businesses and can teach you the things that you don't know. Yeah, because there's a lot you don't. Yes. 
cool. Um, yeah, and yes. finally, this is where negotiate different shipping options for samples. So my suggestion is you air freight initial samples up front before you send a whole lot by sea. So physically get the samples and check what they look like. You know, I've had glass bottles and the lid doesn't quite fit. Yes. And if the lid doesn't fit, well, then I don't want to have sea freighted a thousand over to me yeah. and then find that the entire thing doesn't work. Yeah. So when you come to do, we'll talk a, li a little bit this as well, but when you come to do your order, you've got all your design elements and everything's working on your packaging. You can actually, there are suppliers that you can say, hey, can you air freight me a quarter of the, the order and the rest come by sea freight so yep. that you've got something coming quickly and something coming slowly. And when I mean slowly, sea freight can take a long time. It can take sort of six, eight weeks uh, and then, there is sort of an insurmountable time that it might sit in customs in New yeah. Zealand as well. So there are things to think about there. That's why we say always work backwards and always the, you can never spend enough time on time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Who, uh, Janine, who, yeah, are, we say, who are we selling to? Who are we selling to? So first of all is thinking about the shopper and where and how do they shop. Um, I've had examples of people who wanted to do a really big product, like a, a one kilo, because that was efficient in terms of packaging. Um, but the people, the way they used it was they would only use a small amount and that would last them for three months. So I needed to think, and it would be, the pricing would be wrong for the retailer. So where and how do they actually shop? Is it a bulk buy, a weekly top up? Is it something that needs special storage? So we were talking before mm. this about um, someone who had a fresh product and that really makes a big impact because your shelf life can be really short. So you need to understand that part of yep. the shopper. Yep. Cool. The next part is how do they use it? So I think this is probably where Laura and I both look at it and say, you know, this is where it comes into pack size. You don't want to be too big, too small, and or it actually won't fit on the retailer's shelf. And um, think about things as well, like packaging materials. So glass is beautiful, often I hear. You know, and I launched a range of um, glass products and skincare. And then we went, actually, glass in a shower product uh, is not a good idea or glass in a bathroom. So we ended up switching to plastic, which wasn't what we originally thought for the brand. But if we'd thought more about how they use the product, that's um, a good example of thinking about it more. Yeah. And where they can avoid damage yeah a good way to sort of to think about this is to actually go well how do you use your products you mm -hmm. know if say using skincare as an example if you're doing going to do a skincare range you really just need to be start noticing how you use skincare how do you use it how does your spouse use it how does you if you've got a teenage daughter how do they use their skincare um so start and you know write these things down or take mental notes um, and add that into then how you market and how okay. you create your product. Okay. And then finally, it's what's most important to them. So this is where it comes in the packaging part, which is more. Useful. Yes. All right. Um, oh, yes. Thank so you. Yeah. You can check. Okay. So what's most important to, to these people? Is sustainability important? Uh, is it easy to open? Um, is it... A, what have I written here? Um, attractive to others. Um, leave on the what are we, uh, leave, leave on, on the bench, bench and look good. good. That's that. That's that Instagrammable kind of yeah. feel, which is very very important now. So, um, is it important for this person? It's also about that emotional kind yeah. of feel. You know, how do we want someone to feel when they pick up our packaging or then when they're using our product? Is it important for them to feel safe and secure? Is it important for them to feel uh, notoriety or to feel luxurious yep. what is it that you really want people to feel because if we talk just for one second about why people buy and that's always an emotional it brings it back to a base need and that is the emotions of humans yes. yeah okay so this is where I come to the where are you selling? So think about who your ideal retailers are. Um, you know, service stations sell drinks, high-end bars sell drinks, supermarkets sell drinks. But if you don't understand who your ideal retailer is, then you're going to really struggle in terms of your pack design. If you're going into supermarkets, understand what category do you fit on in shelf? So this is another joyous jargon uh, of FMCG, of groceries. So the category is basically 
the name on the um, aisle sign. So you really need to understand what category do you fit on shelf because that will tell you which category manager you're going to be talking to and where they see your product going in store. So that's where you understand who your competitors are. So drinks can be in the chilled section. They can be also on the shelf. And you can see drinks depending on the type of drink. They could be um, in breakfast drinks or in general beverages. And then within beverages, where do they sit? So really be clear which category you are. And with that, you can then understand what are the similar brands doing in store. So, you know, Boring is a great example of alternate milks are in one litres. Mm. So they said, okay, one litre is the standard that consumers expect and need. Um, but let's take a twist on how they're doing it. Mm. And then when we talk about what kind of shelf are you sitting on, and it sounds a bit strange, but the shelf, you know, is it in a wire cage? Is it hang cell? So you'd notice like Farrah's bread, the wraps, they're all hanging in the bread section. Whereas if you get the same wraps in the Mexican section, your old El Paso ones or your Woolies ones will all be lying down and stacked. Yes. So that's examples of, the kind of shelf you're, you're on and how you're merchandised, how you're um, placed in the store will have a huge impact with your design. And um, just one quick question about the category I thought I'd ask you. What if you have a product that might sit across, say, two different categories? How do you then work out where best to go? Uh, you need to be clear on which one you want to be in and why. So okay. what you have to choose, yes. which sounds horrible. But yeah. The retailer, the last thing you want is them to say it's not me. Yeah. Um, you have to choose and be confident that the one you're going up against, you've got a competitive product, a competitive price, a competitive positioning. And really, there's a reason for them to take you because they're going to have to delete someone else to go on shelf. Mm. So be really clear where you think you have your best chance of success. Excellent. OK, and some tips. Um, so one thing that I absolutely love to do and my husband hates that I love to do it. Um, is to go and stand in store and just have a look what's there. It's totally okay for you to do the same. Uh, and it's also okay for you to go and take photos. Uh, I think people, if there's always just some weird unwritten taboo yeah. about going and taking photos in a supermarket. It's not actually true. No. Um, so you can go there, go and stand where you've, you know, you've done your research on what category that you want to go into. Go and stand there, have a look what's there, what's there, what's not there, uh, yeah. and ask yourself all of these questions. And that's where we talk about the second point is take your samples or prototypes or your ideal packaging and store and check they actually fit on the shelf uh, where you'd ideally like it to go. I was a retailer and I had a very large, very large manufacturer bought me a product in and it was too tall the shelf so I would have had to take out an entire shelf of product from the store in order to put their bottle in and the answer to that is no I'm not going to take it out so make sure and it's a horrible little small thing that it actually fits mm. um, you'll notice that they're not going to the retailers aren't going to move shelf height for you so don't think oh if they just moved it up a little bit then my product would fit there uh, no they're mm. not going to do that and finally, research the retailer website to find out all the guidelines about packaging, shipping, and compliance. So foodstuffs have really good guidance on it. There's a whole lot of checklists in their um, countdown, which is through the Woolworths portal. They also have guidelines. So understand what they're looking for, and they will tell you. And if you can't meet what their guidelines are, um, know that you're going to have to change if you want to keep selling with them. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Get ready to brief, right? This is where this is the where the like brief. <laughs> I've done all right. I've done all the talking in this part. All right. So this is where um some of the fun stuff and um begins. Not to saying that your stuff isn't functioning. No, uh, um. So get ready to brief. So understand very first of all that a brief is, I guess, a, a scope of works that you're going to supply to the design team that you're going to work with. It's not a scary thing. Uh, briefing is something that is, is is really tricky to do. But what I really think if you can do it is imagine it as a shopping list of what you want from your design team. So what is your brand position and um, competitor? So your brand position um, is 
really, what would you say would your brand position be? Who do you want your computer to, who, where do you want your product to sit in a consumer's mind? Yes. And who do, who else do you want them to think about when they think about you? Exactly. Yeah. So for example, if we're using, we're continually using boring oat milk, uh, a boring oat milk, their brand position would have been, okay, so we want to be unlike any other oat milk, um, but we also want to be pretty plain and boring. So let's choose a name that is um, boring, boring. <laughs> <laughs> and simple and straightforward. And what they mean by boring oat milk is there's nothing else in it. It's just yeah. oat milk. And then thinking about, they would have thought about the competitors and gone, okay, so everyone's pretty busy and they're also in a Tetra pack and there's a lot going on. There's pictures of oats and there's pictures of, grains and, and farms soy and, and farms yeah. and everything like that is like then what can we do to be different yeah. so that's a really good question that you can ask yourself is looking at your computers and going how can I be different what's your ideal physical packaging in size a lot of people when they come to me might have some idea and say okay yes I want to be in this glass jar um, and that's okay. You can bring to the table whatever you want when it comes to briefing in a design team. Know that there's uh, if you're there a good designer, they might say, well, you might be better in a, um, a pouch or something like that. Um, be prepared to talk this through and explain why it is that you think your product should be in glass. And it's okay to, to sort of have that and come in with that if you want uh, to be glass, you know, understand why you want to be in glass. Yeah. Um, and if a designer might say, hey, you know, did you know about this option as well? And then be prepared to look at those. Um, <clears throat> be upfront on any deadlines um, or any constraints. So that's why we talked about these timelines first, because when you come to brief your design team, you can say, hey, there's a category launch in uh, seven months, and I'd really like to be there to present my product to that. And then you work backwards with them. They're going to work backwards with you as well. And they'll say to you, okay, it's going to take, say, a um, couple of weeks to come up with the actual design, um, the first concept. And then from there, we'll refine. And then obviously there are um, things that are going to come in to play yeah. there, like your shelf life testing and working with the food, with the food techs. I was going to say, and that's also understanding if they're uh, dead. When we say deadlines, you can articulate back to them if you've done step one. I need to have my sample artwork ready by this date. Yeah. I need to even just have samples to go to the retailers. I need to have, um, you know, the labels in for testing. I don't need the physical label design for a shelf life trial, but we need to have worked out what the pack format is. So is it a pouch? Is it a bottle? Is it a tub? Is it a tin? So having that discussion with them up front is going to be really important part of the brief uh, and I actually slipped in this bit for Laura that said designers can be flexible but aren't magicians <laughs> thank you so as, <laughs> as a client who's briefed in a whole lot of designers over the years it's understanding a good designer does take time uh, and if you give them a week you will get what you um you'll get what you kind of ask for, which is not going right. to be yeah. the in-depth thinking yeah. uh, that you need. If I can give you an example of what might be unrealistic, um, as if, say, um, say Janine, you're the designer, and I say, came to you and say, hey, I've got this amazing uh, kombucha drink, and there's a category launch in three months, and I really want to be there, and I've got five different flavors, and I want to have everything ready to go. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, yes. So it's all about just being really flexible um, with your design. Your design is going to be really flexible, um, so it's kind of about being flexible yeah. as well. And that's our tip is that um, a good designer should have a template and work it through with you. So if you've done briefs before, you might have your own. Um, but if you go and talk to a designer and somebody who's worked in packaging before, they will know the things that you don't. And that's where we talk about... Um, for me, finding someone who knows what they're doing is great. And the more you do up front, the better. So the more you can bring suggestions and the more you can bring them timelines, competitor set, photos that you've taken, the better off you'll be. Absolutely. Okay, so working with the, uh, the right design team the right way. So designers, there's a lot of designers out there. Um, and you want to make sure that you're choosing somebody that's done lots of retail packaging before. 
Uh, all designers are very talented and very creative people. Um, packaging uh, brings in another level of expertise around mm -hmm. understanding the regulations, barcodes, and a whole list, a whole plethora of stuff um, that comes to creating retail packaging. So when you are choosing to work with a design team, make sure that you choose somebody that has done retail packaging before. Uh, and also, do they have experience in your category? Now, you can by all means work with somebody that may have done, say, a different kind of beverage before, but might not have done kombucha. By all means, that's fine. Um, but it's always nice to know that you're working with somebody that's had some understanding or some exposure to the categories that you are going to go into. Understand what you are getting. Uh, ask how many changes and ask questions. So be, uh, if a good designer may, may have a contract, may have some, uh, give you a package deal on working with them, it's okay for you to ask lots of questions. You can ask a very important question to say is, how many concepts am I going to get from you in the beginning? And how many sets of changes am I going to get before I have to start paying over and above what is in my scope of works? And probably from a client side having done this is when you give feedback on changes look at everything at once and take the time so when you know if Laura sent me a design I shouldn't just email back my first thought and then the second one a day later and then the third one a day after that when I've shown it to my husband and friend or whatever try and capture all your feedback and then send it so then you've got yeah, that's when they talk about rounds. Laura says how many rounds of changes. She means how many sets of times can I give feedback? And then she goes and redesigns it. And so yeah, yeah. good would probably be three. Bad would probably be more than 10. Yeah. yeah. More than 10 would be pretty yeah, um, yeah. Because that also extends your time. So understand the number of rounds you make extends your time and depending on your cost can also um, impact your budget. And that's where your timeline can really be at risk yeah. if you're just constantly fiddling. Yeah, so. absolutely. And if you're the kind of person that likes to feedback over the phone, if you're the kind of person that likes to feedback in person, then absolutely do that. Um, most designers are work, used to working in a variety of different ways from, from carrier pigeons to Zoom calls to everything like that. So if you like to sit and actually sit down with your designer in person, if that's possible, by all means do that, if that's the best way for you to get what's out of your head. Um, it's okay to, to, to not know what it is that you want. A good designer can help you find that. Um, it's a lot the probably the biggest comment that I get when people come to work with me is oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body and I don't really know what it is that I want uh, it's a designer's job to be a little bit of an interpreter when bring it out what is in your head because most people I say you know you actually do know what it is that you want you just haven't seen it yet yeah uh, and the best way to articulate what it is that you're after is a mood board mood boards are magic and they will help to create a bit of a picture the style and the look and the feel that you're going for. Pinterest is your friend. Uh, Pinterest is an absolutely wonderful free tool where you can create a mood board um, of all the things that you like. Mood boards don't have to be specific to the category that you're going into. They can be any kind of colors. It might be a handbag or a pair of shoes that you've seen. Yep. Um, and we've got an example of a mood board, which I'll show you now. So this is for a hair care, hair care brand. They wanted natural. They wanted nice, cool tones. They wanted some deep foresty looks. Um, and so this is just images that have been pulled off Pinterest. And so you can see this is just a really quick snapshot. Your mood boards can be much bigger than that. You can be specific on, you know, colors, patterns, whatever it is you like. Uh, and one thing you can do is you can make your mood boards private. So just know that when you yeah. go into Pinterest, you can create a private board and then invite key people. So it's not something you have to have public. So, uh, you know, if you're developing a product that you kind of want to keep on the on the quiet, um, know that you can do that. And that's a really good place to be able to share with anyone and say, look, this is the kind of packaging. Yep. So, for example, you might say, look, I'm thinking, is it do I go with an amber bottle or a clear bottle or do I go colored? So by you pulling these things out, the designer will be able to talk to you and say, which of these are you thinking of? Mm. 
And have you talked to your packaging to su supply to say, you know, is it a <laughs> label on an amber bottle? Is it screen printed so that East Bar one in the bottom left corner, that's a different kind of um, pack design again that's printed onto the bottle or is it um, glass where we need to design something so that routine jar actually has a label on top of the lid so mm. really use it as your prompt for visual design but then also to work out the practical pieces because your designer needs to know how many pieces of artwork am I designing correct absolutely all right understand chat. I was going to say there's some questions I can see popping up Lauren are they anything we should be covering off as we go through. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Uh, Understanding the cost. cost. Right. Okay. Money, money. So um, cost is a huge part of packaging. So your physical packaging is what has one of the biggest impacts on your price and on your cost of goods. So it's not only the cost, but the value you can get for um, your product. So your physical packaging, you need to think about, is it, are you buying it off the shelf? Is it a custom print? How many different packaging elements does it have in it? Do you know, do you have a custom cap? Do you have labels on the cap? Is it a shrink sleeve? I mean, I'm literally looking at these ones here um, and saying an example, you know, if I was looking at this, so this is one where uh, it's more a shrink sleeve onto the packaging. They've used a standard glass bottle. Um, and that's taking a design that gives it a much more premium look rather than having a glass bottle with a paper label that went around it. So understand the different cost considerations because your cost of goods is a key part because we're in mm. business to make money um, and the value you can charge and the price you can charge is really, really important for the retailer. Uh, second is, have you worked out the cost per unit? So working out your cost of all your different um, elements, because it's not just the physical product. It's also if you have a shelf ready tray, so that needs to be printed differently. Uh, and also the shipper. And don't forget the freight, because all of that goes into your cost of goods. So if you're sourcing it from a local New Zealand supplier versus uh, you're having to air freight in like, you know, a unique hack format from um, overseas. Mm. So that's going to add to your cost. And thirdly, do you know the minimum MOQ, which is the minimum order quantity of each packaging element? So a couple of tips is while it's really tempting to order lots just to get a lower price per label, the cost is always going to go down and ask your packaging supplier what their price breaks are. So their price breaks are the volumes at which the price starts to drop. So they might be in the hundreds, they might be in the thousands, but know that... Um, ordering just to get a cheaper price up front can really not only eat into your cash flow fast because you're ordering 10,000 labels at a lower price per label, but you've still got 10,000 labels, uh, which assumes you have 10,000 finished products and leave you with a huge <laughs> amount of waste if you need to make any changes. So, you know, as, as nice as it would be to be perfect from day one, you are probably going to want to change your product maybe in sort of 12 to 18 months. So don't order three years worth of packaging because you probably will want to change it. And then you'll just have waste. And that literally is just money that you have to throw away. That is a label that just goes yeah. Yeah. nowhere. And that's pretty awful from the sustainability perspective, having waste and also for your cash flow, it's true it all up. Um, and one quick note on with on MOQ, so the minimum order quantity. Um, speak with the with your suppliers, with even with your design team, because people that have established relationships with suppliers can sometimes get a lower MOQ. And one thing to note as well is sourcing overseas. Not all big companies, if you're supplying um, from say China, will have massive um, MOQs. Dose and Co is a really good example. So this tub here. Um, actually, you, most people, when you look at this and you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to order 10,000 of these. The, the factory where we get these from, um, I can get about 500 as yeah, a load. Which so, is fantastic. Which is fantastic. So, um, you know, don't, it's sort of, if you've got, if you've got people that already have relationships with suppliers, use them. Yeah. And then finally for me is accept that while it may cost more up front, if you build in that higher cost of goods up front, you'll actually give yourself more margin and wiggle room as you grow because one thing for sure at this point in time is cost of goods are never the same. Know that your cost of goods are going to go up. So if you've said, okay, 
I've built my pricing and my margin structure based on almost worst case of minimum quantity. And as your volume goes up, your margin go, can go up as well uh, because you've got more room to negotiate and you're not sitting there um, with a worst case scenario, which is you've built your cost of goods on 10,000 units and you actually can't survive, mm. you know, manage the cash flow to get to that point. Cool. Okay, so we're talking just a little about pricing here and, and what how it can actually affect how your product looks, but also the retailers that you're going to be able to get into. Uh, I've chosen skincare because there's a massive, massive range of skincare here. So we're looking at EcoStore. Pretty much every, everybody knows yeah. EcoStore, right? And they, they have a low price point. So they have gone, um, obviously they do have a good quality product, but they've gone for a lower price point, which is giving them access to a lot more retailers. I think you can find it in farms, you can find it in supermarkets, you can find it online, you can find it at the warehouse. And then we have your sort of mid-level products, uh, Frula, which is one of my clients, just <laughs> saying, um, which is uh, retail only, and that was what they set out to do. So uh, when uh, she started the brand, she didn't want to do e-commerce. Um, she just wanted to say, this is just going to be good skincare for retail. And we're talking about um, foodstuffs and Countdown and also Woolworths and Costco. Um, which means that she can bring the price up, say, a little bit because she's just focusing on larger retailers, but she still wants it to be accessible. Yep. So she's in the sort of the $22 range. Then we start talking about Kales. I mean, they are um, another large brand that is in a number of different retailers, but potentially just focusing mostly on your, your Mecca, yep. um, Sephora, those kind of places. And I was going to say, I look at Kiehl's and what it says to me is the amount of words and copy on their pack is, um, it's a place where people are going to stop and read it. Yes. Whereas if you look at Eco Store and Frula, they're much simpler for like, a, you know, that's the three second. Yes. I recognize Eco Store, I'm going to grab it and go. I recognize Frula, I'm going to grab it and grow it. Kiehl's, before I drop $60 on a moisturizer. It's pretty small. I probably actually want to read it a lot more. Absolutely. And then we have the luxury brands like Clinique. Uh, specifically, they're going to go and approach people like um, David Jones or Maya or the one that I've forgotten about, Smith and Coe. Smith and Coe that's it. Um, or they'll be at their own counters in somewhere like um, the Farmers. Yeah. So they can afford to have uh, probably glut, they have glass. Uh, they've got they've spent a lot of time on the actual packaging itself um, and they're positioned that's that brand position we were talking about earlier they position themselves as being a high-end retailer and now I'm going to show you an extreme okay so while I was looking for examples to actually put into this um, into the webinar I came across this on Smith & Coe's website so just so you know each of those bottles is only 15 mils per bottle um, but this just shows you that brand positioning and how absolutely what, 15 mils 15 mils is probably this yeah if it's you're about, lucky this is a probably 30 oh this is a 30 mil so it's half the it's size. about the size of a nail polish um so basically what you can do is with you can go absolutely insane with your brand positioning in the beginning they said we really only want a few people to be able to afford our product we're going to buy some really thick glass it looks like perfume bottles we're going to stick it in a metal case and we're only going to sell it at select retailers that can afford to have us like um, and this all like Smith & Coe's. Yep. So this is an example of they understand the retailer they're going for. They understand the consumer and how they're shopping for it. And they understand the value of packaging and what investing in packaging can do because uh, you're not going to spend $2,750 on packaging that is um, plastic off the shelf. And generally, yes, La Mer is an exception but generally your packaging <laughs> yeah. should reflect your positioning and the cost you're able to invest in it wonderful okay shelf impact so this is where not to say the rubber hits the roads and these are photos literally didn't touch the shelf at all these are some photos um, from my local countdown so step four is understanding the shelf impact of the physical shelf so think about things like will it stand out or recede under retail lights there's nothing like um, designers where you know, it looks amazing on their screen and it looks amazing when you print it out in an A3 with this label, but then you, when you actually put it on the physical shelf, it can die. 
uh, that's to do with the type of substrate you have, that's to do with the type of finish that you have on a product. Think about um, your packaging and the finish. So when I say the finish, it's what I mean, is it shiny, is it matte? Uh, think about what happens once the first pack is gone. So you can see on some of these um, watties have a shelf. So that's what we mean when we say a shelf ready tray. So they have it where it's black and they actually have the name of the soup on the front. Um, plant proteins. So the watties up in the top corner there, they've gone for color as the way of differentiating and calling out the 15 grams of plant protein because the brand is called plant protein. So they've really use that for them only organic they've not really got anything they just say new and your wattie's tin soup just is a tin on a tray that's been around since adam adam was a cowboy mm -hmm. um also think about what happens when the first pack is gone uh, and don't hide the important stuff so for me while i really like the whitlock soup which is the white one on the right hand side here that's actually three different varieties of soup uh which isn't is easy to see and you have to really look at the graphics so the way they've called that out is put the name of it on the front of their tray so you've got to think this is what I say is you've got to think about how is my product going to look when it sits on a retail shelf so if I was doing a sample I would be literally putting it on the shelf and taking a photo of it next to the rest of the products yeah. you know only organic and plant protein look very similar basically the code is put a bowl with a picture of the soup and on white and the name of it in the middle and so yeah <laughs> and the ingredients yeah so shelf impacts really key absolutely it is okay online it's important as physical displays so as we've moved into a digital world and as particularly after covid the, the digital side of retailers has become really really important so how will that look um, it's important that you take photos of your product from different angles. Uh, one of the rookie tips that we've got down below here is that a number of retailers will require you to supply images of your product um, at a certain size, as in the image to be a certain size, on a white background. And the great thing is, is that most of the retailers, even though they're completely different companies, including GS1, are going to ask for photos in pretty much exactly the same size. Um, so that's really important that you get clear cut. And we, when I talk about clear cut, it means no background, none whatsoever. It's just on white. Um, and make sure that they look really nice too. It's not just um, you going and taking a photo with your phone um, because yeah. it's almost like it's this is your online shelf. So you want people when they're whizzing through the page um, with the same amount of time as you would on a physical shelf, you want your products to look great. But the awesome thing about being having online retailers is there is actually some opportunity for you to have a little bit more marketing play. And as you can see, Daily Good um, have uh, won lots of good awards, good on them. Um, and that's what they've chosen to put in that little tiny space above the specific area where their shop is on Chemist Warehouse. Yeah. And one tip just for GS1 is they can take the photography for you. Um, their costs aren't hideous. Uh, you do need to use GS1. You must use GS1 for barcodes. The retailers will expect you to do it, and we'll touch on GS1 a little bit more. But also the team at GS1 are used to dealing with small suppliers, so please don't be afraid. Yeah. Talk to them. I've called them and said, can you just help me with things? And they will talk you through all the steps. They can also help you dealing with the retailers. So if there's any problems and in interface between the retailer systems and GS1, they're there to help because they want to see businesses and brands work yep. and they want you to use well you have to use their system so they want to teach you so know that you can call GS1 know that they understand the retailer requirements and they'll tell you when things are right or not yes all right my the one thing that I You're was like better. oh my gosh okay so this is my absolute pet peeve when with packaging and with food uh with new food brands is make time for sample packs so what that generally what i mean by a sample is um you can get every single uh whether you, whether it's a label or whether it's a tub um like the dose and co tub here is the thing that you want to make sure that you build into your timelines is saying hey can you send me a couple of um th with the design on so that then um, I can check everything physically. And the reason that we want you to be able to check everything physically is a thing called 
proofing fatigue and it's where you look at the mm -hmm. same design and the same packaging over and over over on screen it actually becomes quite difficult to spot errors yeah where you have a physical sample then you can check all the sizing how the like the pack hierarchy we're going to talk about that at some point too um how your logo looks how the colors look do they all match up and then you're going to take this beautiful little sample here and you're going to go in store and you're going to put it on shelf don't worry if it's something secretive in NPD. Nobody's looking at you. They're, they're looking at their shopping lists. Yeah. And that's where we have things like shelf life testing as well. So make sure that the product you've got. So if you've got a cardboard tub and you're putting food grade products in it, then it's actually got the right lining. So shelf life testing can take time. So understand all those things. Uh, showing a few customers. So not just your family, as much as we love our family. Yes, because your family's going to love it no matter what we say. Yeah. have to. <laughs> uh, and make sure that with the um, manufacturer, so if you're not making it yourself, that your manufacturer can actually fill and process the label, um, the packaging that you've got. And I know this sounds really obvious, but that's the whole point of this talk, is to call out the things that can seem obvious but can actually trip people up. Um for example, when you're having a round label like this, you actually want it to have this tolerance here and your bot, um, bottler will want it to have the label because they can't absolutely guarantee that this will exactly line up. So having that little space there means that they allow for the minor tolerance that they have when designing it. So if your designer designs it and it all overlaps and then it doesn't line up, you're going to have something that's crooked. So yeah. Do the test. Yeah, the absolutely. Test. And yes, yeah, yeah. Do, do the test. test. Do the test. Um, and then also the other really awesome thing about getting sample packs is then if these are say 99% correct, like if you just if you do you get this and you go, oh, I just want to adjust a few little minor things, these sample packs can then be used for your product photography, um, for your lifestyle photography, all the other bits that you need while you're waiting for your main order to arrive. So really good tip. That's why sample products are so, so, so important. And my tip that I was given by my very first boss was to read the copy backwards. Oh, yes. So if you're uh, proofing it, don't read it forwards. So instead of this that says, hello, you, we're here for your daily dose of health, health and wellness, I would read wellness and health of dose. So I'm not reading it for a grammatical sense. I'm reading it to check that all the spelling is right. Yes. And sounds, I, my very first job, I had a spelling mistake on a product that was being printed on tens of thousands of tins. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. Everyone does it. Like Everyone said, does it. Proofing fatigue. Read it backwards. Yeah, proofing fatigue. It is a big thing. All right. Regulations and compliance, everyone's favorite thing. When you get a nice design and then you send it off to your food tech and he tells you you can't do some certain things, it's got to go through that process. So the first one is uh, engaging a food tech to sign off my packaging. Really, 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 really important um, because what happens is they are going to be the gateway to being able to get into retailers because retailers mm -hmm. are going to have their own compliance people that need to check over everything as well. So you want to make sure that you get a food tech to sign off on uh, your nutritional information, your ingredients and any kind of health claims or things that you are getting on that. And once they say, and it can be as little as them sending you an email and saying, yep, you're good to go. It's written down. You've got that. And um, everything is checked off. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, we had that Lewis Road example. So that's where getting a food tech to come in and actually triple check everything um, is really vital really vital all right um ensure your claims are legit um and so if i've got a package here and i'm saying it's uh, high in protein there are actually regulations around being able to say those things um that's probably a conversation for another day but um if you have product that has some health claims um, there are regulations through New Zealand, through MPI, and also in pretty much in every single market yeah. that you're going to go and try and get into, you need to be able to back up what you're saying. You cannot put onto packaging that it's high in protein if you cannot prove with science that it is yeah. actually okay. And the retailers will expect it yes. because their biggest thing is they are representing the brand to sell to consumers mm. and they do not want any consumer complaints about a consumer buying a product that they believe is wrong yes. on shelf. 
All right, any kind of um, logos or things that you are going to put on to support uh, your unique product, your new, unique selling points? Is it vegan? Is it celiac? Uh, Ruth, who's on this call, um, will know, and she has a celiac product. Um, that there are rigorous testing, not just on your product, but also on your packaging and also where you're actually manufacturing mm -hmm. your product as to whether you're allowed to say certain things. B Corp's a wonderful thing. Um, if you don't know B Corp, go and Google it. Um, it it's a very rigorous uh, process to get that. But if you can get it, it is, it is actually a really neat kind of badge that you can be able to put yeah. on. And also, if you say, yeah, all of my ingredients are vegan, yeah, there's no animal products in it, you also want to check where you are manufacturing. If you're manufacturing with a contract manufacturer, make sure that the line that they're actually manufacturing on hasn't just had a big meaty product go yeah. through it and then they're doing yours in dairy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Checking my barcodes with GS1. Who is GS1? They are the gatekeeper of barcodes. Um, they also do a lot of other stuff. Um, but it's important that you can go and get all of your products verified and it will, and it's a simple cost. You send them a PDF or a physical sample of your actual product, get them to scan it, check that it works. Um, and if they're happy, it means less pain for you and the retailer when you actually go. There's nothing uh, worse than having a product that won't scan. If it doesn't scan, you run the risk of being delisted in store because you are now holding up the queue. Yeah, and it is a requirement. So for foodstuffs, you have to send in the GS1 report. Yeah. And they want it on the unit and the shipper. Yes. And they also need to make sure that all the dimensions are correct. So one of the things around barcodes and we'll come to cases uh, is checking all your dimensions of everything and getting it loaded into GS1 correctly because foodstuffs pull it out of the GS1 central library. So it is really important. I know people can look at the cost, uh, but the cost of that versus the cost of not getting ranging or having to fix your packaging, uh, it pales in comparison. I'm not going to lie, it's a massive pain in the process for a designer, yep. but it works and it has to be done. Yep. All right. Um, check your target retailer's compliance list. Yeah, so you'll, as I said before, if you've done your homework right at the start, you'll have a list of everything that you need to um, put in for the retailer's compliance. So make sure you've got that all done in terms of all the elements of your packaging. And then finally, um, LAPS and TAPS. So joyous acronyms, LAPS is the liquor advertising pre-vetting check and TAPS is for therapeutic products. So therapeutic products aren't just medicines, but that's where you're making any therapeutic claim. So it restores immunity, supports a healthy gut. Mm. You know, there's a whole lot of claims that people can make, not just on food products, but also on the likes of skincare products. So reduce wrinkles. Yes. Uh, and you can actually be caught out with complaints um, that can go through um, on your pack. So if your pack is in advertising and you make a claim, then you can get stuck there as well. So absolutely. I mean, these, all of these regulations, everything on this list is there, not just to support you, but also to support your customers, right? Because you don't, uh, because what you really want is to make sure that the customer is super, super happy with your product, understands how it works, understands how to use it and what it's going to help them with. So having all of this right is not just also to make your retailer happy, it's also to make your customer and happy. reduce your risk. Reduce your reduce risk. Reduce your risk. That's what we're all about. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Um, but, well, so that is the five steps. Uh, how well, are we we're basically being on for time. Oh, so that's how we are. That's because we're good with timing, right? <laughs> um, okay. But wait, there's more. We've got a few other little bits we're going to share with you. Okay. So... What to highlight on your packaging? Now, there's a word that I mentioned before, and that is hierarchy. So not everything needs to be the same size. Not everything's to be shouted at. If you go into a new room and you have, say, five people, and then you ask them all, oh, how are you doing? And everybody yells at you at once. You're not going to hear anything. Mm. And so it's important then to just go, what is what needs to be shouted? Mm -hmm. What needs to be whispered? A good example, and um, we've got some examples we're going to show you in a second with that, um, and is, you know, your logo, obviously, people need to know who you are, uh, what your product actually is, mm -hmm. 
is the flavor really important or is the un- or is the actual product benefits more yeah. important? So that's a good thing to think about. So that's I uh, so what are your USPs, your unique selling points? What makes you different from everybody else? And one of the things, and that's where we use the example of boring, is they were really, really clear on what things needed to go on the front of the pack and also what needs to go on the back of the pack. So it can be really tempting to try and pack everything on the front. And reality is, as we said, in those two to three seconds, uh, you need to really understand what are your consumers looking for and what's the thing that's going to get them to take it off the shelf. Is it the flavor? Is it the type of product is? You know, if you're an alcoholic thing, is it 0%? So yeah. Absolutely. Uh, If you can't support it, don't claim it. I mean, that's what we were speaking about before. If you can't prove that your drink is low in sugar, then it's probably best that you don't say it. There are, I mean, we could, I could get into this and talk about it for hours and hours. There are ways that you can get some claims across um, without needing to support it. If you more of generalize, if you generalize things, but we won't go into that today. Yeah. And again, get everything checked. Yes. How many times have we said that? that yeah. We're going to say it more. Okay. Um, this is on to me. So case count. So case count is really important. So and it is your responsibility. So it's often something that I see can trip um, small brands up is understanding what the ideal number is for the retailer or distributor. So Laura's highlighted there on the, on the case. So when I say the case, What I mean by case count is how many units are in that box. And the reason that's important is because the retailer will buy in those units. And what they don't want is to buy three months worth of product. So if you make the box, oh, it's much cheaper for me to ship or to get it from the manufacturer in 24, because 24 is cheaper. The retailer may say, look, we only sell one unit a week. I don't want to buy 24 weeks worth of product in one box and your shelf life might expire in that time. Yeah. So you really, really need to understand what the ideal number is. You can probably find it out by going um, and, you know, having a bit of a nosy pack and save a great because they have the shippers um, up the top. So the case is at the top. So you can look at it uh, and also think about how many units would they sell in a week and you may not want any less than two or three weeks worth of stock, but probably no more than five or six weeks. Because for you, it's about how often you're going to get a repeat order on that product. And if it's too big, you know, nobody wants just one order every six months from a retailer. Look, and it's okay to ask questions yeah. about, um, and be really specific. When you yeah. go and speak to your retailer, you say, hey, would it be better for me to give you a case of eight? Or would it be better for me to give you a case of 12 or yeah. six or something yeah. like that? It's all right to go and I know that retailers seem more big and scary. And yep, they are big and scary. But it's also okay to go and ask yeah. questions. Yeah, 100%. Okay, barcodes. Um not boring, trust me. Um, it's really important to get these right. There are certain sizes of barcodes and different barcodes, as you can see, that you need. Um, so the first one on the left-hand side there is called an EAN13. And it is called that because there are 13 unique numbers um, that are registered to that specific product only. Uh, and so the magic, you know, obviously everybody's been shopping when it goes beep and goes through the scanner that then gets registered through to uh, to GS1's database and also will come back to you and let you know how many you're selling and where. The next one over there is uh, in the middle is an ITF barcode and that's going to go onto your, um, your shelf ready. Um, and then obviously your shipper barcode as well. So every single product you have, every flavor, every stage of packaging, every layer of packaging um, has a barcode that is specific yeah. to it. And we can talk, we're not going to go into detail, no, but that's not. it's a separate <laughs> thing on yeah. how a barcode is put together. But know that, again, you can talk to GS1. GS1 will help you with your barcode setups. Um, and you can't use the same barcode, can't use the same number across everything. No. It's a big thing. Yeah. Don't think you can just get one on the unit and put it on the shipper. No. 
Yeah, they and, have to be different. And there are also um, changes in barcode when you change a product by, I think it's more than 70%. If you 20, change, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, it's awful. It's only 20%. 20% now, they've changed barcode. that. Um, 20%, yeah. then you will, and um, then you will need to update your yeah. barcode and yeah. all of your images and everything in general. Um, it's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay. Um, ready to pitch packaging checklist. So this is um, before you go and talk to the retailer. So we just wanted to put a final thing in place. So have you done a physical check on the size of the different packaging elements being the unit in the case? So I've seen one where the um, supplier had a product and it was a bag and what they did was they folded it over when they went in the case. So then theoretically the case height was shorter than the physical item. GS1 just says, sorry, that doesn't make sense. Your case has to be bigger to do the physical check on all the elements. Uh, make sure your claims are signed off and keep the paperwork. So keep the paperwork for everything. Don't think, oh, an email is fine. You need to have um, physical documents. Do your timeline check. Make sure that everything's arriving in the right time and place. And then your cost check. So this is when um, make sure your margin model still all stacks up. So now's the time to do your final price review because uh, before you pitch to the retailer is the last chance you have to change your price. Once you pitch to them, you can't say, whoops, sorry, I got my cogs wrong on my packaging and I need to lift my price by 10% because they won't. Yeah, listen. and what you would have, I mean, once you've gone through this massive process, you may find that your pricing model has changed slightly based yeah. on the packaging or even look, and this is a really sucky thing, but um, it's just the world that we live in today. By, by the time you finish this process, you may find that one of your ingredients is more yeah. expensive. And then our final thing we just said is triple check. Oh my everything. gosh, please, yes. please check yes. everything again yeah. and again. And don't be afraid to, and give it to somebody else to check. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, understand really quickly, understanding sustainability. Um, don't rely on imported packaging manufacturers to know the recycling claims in your country. On the left here, I've got some examples. The bottom one is New Zealand and the top one is Australia. So you can see that there are different ways that you need to sort of say what um, can be recycled. From. And you need to know each part of your packaging. Uh, Frula is a great example. The cap is a different code to the actual bottle itself. And then the cardboard box that it goes in is another code as well. You can actually find out these codes simply by Googling them. Um, or you can actually ring up um, and talk to manufacturers directly. But if you are using a manufacturer overseas, know that they um, have no responsibility for knowing what your local recycling uh, agenda is. Each part of your packaging needs to be accounted for when you're talking about sustainability. And that is the cap, the box, um, right down to the little spray nozzle and the, the tin lid that you're going in. Yeah. And retailers will also want to know about the sustainability of your products and make sure you actually understand, you know, what kind, is it a five, is it a six, is it a one, is it a two, they will what they expect you to know this don't guess yes now yeah. greenwashing is a thing be careful what you claim so when i say greenwashing it's perfectly fine to say that your product is plastic free but if you stick a little scoop in there that's um that looks wooden but actually has plastic fibers through it it's not that it also can matter um on what kind of inks you're using uh, whether it is a tin line or something like that so mm. um be really really careful with what you claim about recycling yep plastic fleet uh, plastic flea is a uh, is a great one um that, that you can use instead of saying recycling um because there may be parts of your packaging that needs to be removed um a good cocktail co which is the one that janine had before with the sleeve you can recycle the bottle, but you can't recycle the label. So you have to take that off first. Yeah. All right, the final wrap up. Here we are. I know. Before <laughs> this is where I'm conscious of people's time. So yeah. we're, we're going to give 15 minutes for questions. So our final wrap up, our final five key points. One, be really clear on your key dates up front and track your timeline as you go. So don't just set it at the start and hope that you'll get there for the retailer review. Make sure you understand. You know, if you really need to push on getting samples there, um, this is key. As I said, first, you miss the retailer review date. It can absolutely throw your launch out for months. Mm. 
Um, be clear on your shopper, your user, and your target retailer. Um, your shopper and your user can be different people. Yeah. For example, um, the woman, um, not being a generalized here, but women might go and do the, uh, buy all of the groceries, um, but the user might be the man or the child in the household. Um, so they can be different people. Number three, uh, prepare for your briefing. So this is as the client. So as yes. the person who's making it, you need to make sure you've done your homework. So have you pulled together your Pinterest board and find a designer with experience that you can trust. So there's a whole lot of places that you can go and questions you can talk to a designer and say, you know, we gave you the points before. Have you worked in this category before? Can you show me some examples of what you've done? And be comfortable having questions. You don't need to know everything. You absolutely don't. But yeah. you need to find someone that you can trust to fill in all the gaps on what you don't know. Test everything. Fits together. Um, it is a giant puzzle. And if you're missing a piece, then um, it's, you know, when you do a puzzle and it's really annoying, you get to the last part and you're missing a piece. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that, except 10 times worse. Yeah. So test everything. And then finally, as we've said again and again, make sure you tick all the boxes. Retailers are all over compliance. They need to make sure the barcode scans, the product sits on shelf, that your claims all stack up and that everything is going to work. It's their money. So they're buying the product off you. They're buying it usually more than one at a time and they need to make sure that it's compliant and that their risk level is really managed. So make it as easy for the category manager to accept you as possible. Wonderful. Okay. So quick, some examples here. Do you want to talk about mooring? We haven't talked about uh, it enough, I, I think. Th I, I think probably just a final reminder. Um, boring were a new brand. They went with an experienced designer. And for me, the key points for them is they have a really simple range. They have two SKUs. They took a category convention of milk um, from fresh and put it into the, into the shelf um, and made it really stand out <laughs> on shelf. Absolutely. So as a retailer, I would tick all the boxes for me. Yes. Uh, Dose & Co, another really good example. And I wanted to put this in here for use of like of, of hierarchy, what's important. It's very clear, very simple. The colors are very clear and very simple. You recognize the only color that actually changes out is the flavor. The whole layout, everything is the same across every product they have. And the health claims, which I might add, have all been checked very, very rigorously, are very simple and easy to see. So that's some examples of people that are doing it right. And remember that they started small too somewhere. The very first dose of coat water was actually only 75 tins. Wow. So there you go. And now they have a Kardashian. Exactly. Really. Yes. And Ellen. And Ellen yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, your turn for questions. Uh, but just quickly, because then I can shut this down and yeah. I can figure out how to get people's questions. Oh. Um, we're just going to say quickly, what's next? Getting digital with launch um, and some other classes to be announced. We're going to do some in-person classes, um, hopefully with the Food Bowl, who is a wonderful um, company that helps other food brands get set, set up. Um, if you could keep an eye on Retail Rookie, our little website we've set up for more information. But the next July session that we're going to do for free online is Getting Digital all things online that you need to know when yeah. it's launching So this is product. everything from your website, your social proof, um, making sure all your assets are sorted and you've given yourself your best foot forward for retailers. Cool. Um, we we just want to say thank you very much, everybody, yeah. for coming. Our details are down there, but you can also uh, get hold of Lauren if you need to speak to either of us uh, individually. And, um, yeah, thank you, everybody, thank for... You going through this massive journey with us i hope that we haven't just completely blown your brains out <laughs> on a friday some, on a friday yeah um, but it's a long weekend so you've got a whole yeah. three days to think about it now so yeah okay now how do i look up here oh you do it you this. you do this bit so we didn't have many questions over the chat so if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question please do Hi, sorry, I had one. I you may have missed it. Um, you guys mentioned quite a bit about foodstuffs and Woolworths, but mm -hmm. how do we know? Um, like if it's a different retailer, how do we approach them and ask what are your requirements? So, what kind of retailer are you thinking? Like a big... Mecca. What's it? Sorry, Mecca. Mecca. Um, Mecca would probably not be too dissimilar uh, I would look on their website 
So first of all, go to their website. Often they can have places that say becoming a supplier. Um, give them a call. They have suppliers that are there. Look at the other competitor products that they have on shelf. So I don't know whether you're a makeup or a cosmetic. Look at how they're packaged. So do they come in a box? So is your product a um, small container in a box? Is it something that can stand alone? Uh, the GS1 barcode will be exactly the same. That applies to every retailer. The claims that you want to justify will apply for every retailer. Um, when it comes to any specifics around things like case count, uh, that's when you're having the conversations directly with the category manager. Uh, LinkedIn can also be a nice little place yeah. if you're confident enough to find these people that are over the stores that you want to actually go into. LinkedIn's a great place and you can just send them a really friendly message and say, hey, is it all right if I ask you a couple of questions yeah. or can you point me in the direction of somebody that can answer these yeah. questions for me? But know that those compliance things for any retailer that is looking at their reputation, that's why they're looking at claims. So they want to know that you can tick everything off. Thank you oh, so much. That's okay. Carla, do you have a question? Hi, sorry, I've had to go in and out because I'm working. <laughs> that's okay. That's a bit of um, a juggle, but um, I've got most of it. <laughs> um, but um Thank you for inviting me to this. This has been really awesome. So I'm um, formulating a, a hair product and I'm just at the stage where um, I finally got a sample that I'm happy with. And now I've got this huge um, task in front of me to organize packaging and branding and come up with a name and all that sort of stuff. So I think um, this has really sort of helped me to um organize my thoughts <laughs> oh you're so welcome look it's I know that it seems like a massive mountain to climb but if you just take it in little steps yeah. um that is the best way forward so um it's actually a really great segue by the way because the, there's a couple little freebies that Janine and I have put together that we're going mm -hmm. to give out to each of you and the one that I'm going to supply to you is um who to speak to and when um awesome. so I'm going to give you that um, and you're more than welcome. If you have any questions you want to talk about branding or naming or anything like that, I'm my doors are open to chat. Yeah. And oh, thanks, I'll mm -hmm. be sending out a jargon guide because I know I'm mm -hmm. on the jargon <laughs> um, related to packaging as well as related to working in um, large retail. One of the things I'd probably say, Carla, is don't be afraid to find some smaller retailers um, that you can go and talk to and ask them, you know, how do they choose the brands? Which ones are most popular? It's funny, actually, often I'll say, go in and just talk to the staff in a store and you can just say, ah, oh, which one's most popular? Because you might be trying to decide flavors or if it's hair care, you know, are there particular benefits that people are looking for? Hairdressers mm. like to talk, like they <laughs> will just chatty, chat, chat. Yeah. So find the kinds of hairdressers that you want um to endorse your product and then ask them yeah we will do it there's a class that we're going to do at some point on creative ways to actually get um you know into to these stores like yeah. because there are there are there are roadblocks and as you can see in the course that we've just been through to getting into large retail so one of the things that we are going don't worry we've got yeah, so many, we've yeah. got a long list of things that yeah. we want to talk to all of you about but um, there are lots of little ways that you can kind of get that proof, that sales yeah. proof and the social proof for your for your yeah. for your products. So yeah. and it's, just yeah, and to give you our entire goal is probably for me two things. One is reducing the risk because when you're a small business owner, <laughs> it can feel really nerve wracking because this is your money and your business on the line. And second is to give you confidence. So we want to give you all our experience so that you can feel confident with your pitching, your product, your pricing, with what you're doing with your marketing activity. So then you can present your brand in the best way possible. Yeah. Super exciting for you, though. You're at like at the really you're exciting. The fun part. You're in the fun part. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> you are. Oh, it may not feel like it at times, but don't worry. You absolutely <laughs> cool. Anyone awesome. else? Thanks, you. Don't be shy, now's the time. Countdown. <laughs> um, so as Laura said, you can find, uh, if you look on my Pitchfork website, I've got a whole lot of free resources 
um, checklists, guides, dealing with retailers, margins, you know, <laughs> There's a whole lot more in there under yep. the retail rookie section. Um, I've got a YouTube channel, which um, we talk to various people in the yep. in the industry and other brands. So we're going to fire through, uh, lovely Lauren's going to fire through an email um, this afternoon with all the little bits that we've got for you yep. and links to all of these cool resources. Yep. Anyone else got some questions? Victor? I just wanted to make a comment, if that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, for me, this is my second time going through this process and I just wanted to share it with everyone that I wish I had this information before I started so <laughs> I think everyone's really lucky here and to really take it on board because I mean I've had quite a few bumps and big ones for example I had my labels transposed from one SKU to the other and I had to write that all off that was early on when I started mm -hmm. and and then um, I didn't have money when I started, so I, I used a student as my first designer, and the printing process was a nightmare. So I think it's, I think the point I'm trying to make is, I've realized now, after being around for a couple of years, that it's better to make that investment now than later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. I agree. And thank you, Kavita. And I know Kavita personally, and she's had her fair share of ups and downs, but she's still here. And it just shows you that the determination and the mindset yeah. that you can have when you're coming into this business is really important. Um, yeah. Expect that you're not going to get everything right. Um, it just doesn't happen. Perfectionism in products is just not yeah. a thing. Um, and, and, and so as long as you understand that and know that there are going to be some roadblocks that come up, and, um, and also know that this is not a cheap process. It's not meant to be a cheap process. Um, and it is something that you will, um, you're going to sink a lot of money into. But the the other side of it, when you come out the other side and you're there and you're experiencing and you you know your products out there is, is a wonderful feeling. Yep. And that's when you start, yeah. make, start making the money. Yeah. And, and I think that's where, you know, we're here. Mm. Not, we're here not to... We can't solve all your problems, but we can certainly share all the the insights. The insights. I was going to say the mistakes, the the yeah. rookie trip ups yeah. that we've certainly seen, yeah. and I've personally experienced yeah. um, many along the way. Yeah, cool. yeah. So thank you, thanks, Kavita. They're, it's nice to know that you know yeah. that it's helpful because that's oh, yeah, that's yeah. what yeah. we're about. Anybody Actually, else? Anyone else? Um, was there any written questions, Lauren, that came through? Um, they've been answered. There was one over um, GS1, but yeah, gs1.org.nz. Yes, yeah, cool, yeah. cool. Okay, okay. Well, we'll let everybody get off and go and soak all that goodness up. Um, I will send you all a PDF of this document um, for reference. Um, and by all means, if any other questions come up um, after this please do get in touch um, with myself or with Janine. We'd love to help you. That's why we are here. Um, and we wish you all the best of luck with this journey into retail. Yeah, and don't get stuck in traffic for the long weekend. Yeah, don't get be stuck safe. in traffic. Be, be safe, safe, everybody. Be safe, everyone. Enjoy the long. Let's pray for a little bit of like no so, rain. I know, I'm looking out the window. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, Kaki Thanks, day. everyone. Bye. No, no, go on.